I'm going to continue working through the at attempt at self-criticism as we're going through these lecture notes discussing these primary ideas, okay? Like I did last week for Nietzsche's understanding of tragedy and why he thinks these Greeks of the heroic age needed tragedy and what it did for them. So um, attempt at self-criticism, the Antigone. Uh, I will send the midterm sometime this week. I'm actually going to send two midterms and we'll discuss what that means Thursday or Tuesday, okay? Um, and so be on the lookout for that. Otherwise, we're in great shape. Any questions about where we are? Nope, good, great to see you. What I wanna do is continue moving through the major themes that are necessary really to read Nietzsche, to engage the book, understand what's happening, and, and then ultimately move into Foucault. Um, and so we're gonna continue to work off the outline I sent you. And today we're going to deal primarily with Roman numeral point two, Nietzsche's critique of Platonic and Christian metaphysics, okay? Um, last week, last two lectures, we, we spent a lot of time just talking about Roman numeral one, what, does, what do we mean by the term tragedy when we use it in this class? And, and, and what is Nietzsche's kind of stylized interpretation of Greek tragedy, the heroic or tragic perspective? And why did, does he value so highly uh, tragic art as a kind of cultural production, right? And so we, we, we spoke about all of that. Now, Nietzsche's interpretation of Greek tragedy, his valorization of Greek tragedy, his celebration of Greek tragedy brings him immediately into conflict with the emergence of Socratic and Platonic philosophical metaphysics and by extension, the emergence of New Testament Christianity, um, Christian metaphysics, theological metaphysics. Uh, and, and this actually plays a very important role in the book. And it's also a critical element in Nietzsche's philosophy overall, not just, not just his interpretation of Greek tragedy and why it's important. But if, if there is a kind of more comprehensive Nietzschean view out there, um, then his, his encounter with the emergence of Socrates and Plato and later New Testament Christianity, and, and, and not just his encounter with it, but his understanding of it and, and his critique of it, his, his kind of this savage critique of it, really sets up the kind of Nietzschean perspective that when people use Nietzsche's words, they talk about Nietzsche's philosophy, that's what they're talking about. So we, I want to spend just a few minutes. We're, we're going to be talking about this tension throughout the entire class. So we're, we're going to be visiting this theme, moving in and out of it, looking at it from different perspectives and gazes, all the way through Foucault and Kafka. But I want to discuss in a structured way, probably the last ever structured thing I'll say in this class, but I want to talk about it in, in, a, in, a, in a coherent and structured way as I can. Nietzsche's critique of Platonic, uh, Socratic, Platonic, um, and, and of philosophy, and of course, emergence of New Testament Christianity, some type of theological metaphysics. Um, and, and again, like I said, it's important, not just in the broader sense, but the last four books of The Birth of Tragedy that we will we will read, Nietzsche will discuss the death of tragedy, specifically. Nietzsche will, will spend some of the most beautiful, brilliant chapters in the book discussing the emergence of Socrates, the emergence of Platonic political philosophy, and, and literally how that emergence constitutes what he literally calls the death of tragedy. The title of the book should have been The Birth and Death of Tragedy, really, um, because the, the, the book ends with Nietzsche's critique of the death of tragedy, with the emergence of Socrates, with the emergence of Plato, and then by extension, uh, Christian metaphysics. And then of course, we will end the course with a reading of Foucault. 
which applies a Nietzschean analysis to the Enlightenment. Um, so Foucault will take up Nietzsche's project of this critique of metaphysics by applying it uh, to our time, the Enlightenment, and the emergence of what we could loosely call the normative social, um, behavioral, and medical sciences. So this is going to be a critical theme in, in Nietzsche in the book, in Nietzsche's understanding, his philosophy in general, and we're going to see Foucault pick up this project and almost perfect it in and through his critique of the Enlightenment, in and through the book Discipline and Punish. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to just talk a little bit about that today. We're going to talk briefly about Nietzsche's critique of metaphysics. We're going to talk about what metaphysics is, what, what is he actually critiquing. Most of you have heard this from me, so please just be patient, but it's really important that we know exactly what it is that Nietzsche is critiquing. What are the core philosophical ideas associated with metaphysics that Nietzsche is so aggressively critical of, okay? And then we're gonna finish by reading some passages in the, in the attempt at self-criticism where Nietzsche talks about this, all right? So point two, Nietzsche's critique of Platonic and Christian metaphysics. Nietzsche's account and interpretation of Greek tragedy and the heroic perspective brings us to his famous critique of Platonic and Christian metaphysics. As I said earlier, the last four chapters in The Birth of Tragedy, we will examine Nietzsche's account of the emergence of Socratic and Platonic philosophy and the way this emergence represents what he calls the death of tragedy. And this is really important. This is a monumental moment, right? Uh, because for Nietzsche, the emergence of metaphysical philosophy and religion not only destroys the tragic and the heroic perspective, but more importantly, or equally as important, it initiates the beginning of a long sickness in Western society that he calls nihilism, right? And this, this simply cannot be exaggerated, right? Nietzsche is going to argue, and we've already been talking about this as we've been moving through this already, it's only the third or fourth lecture. Nietzsche is going to argue that the emergence of Socratic philosophy, the emergence of Platonic philosophy, the emergence later of New Testament Christianity, the moralization of human life, the moralization of human life, the view with Socrates, with Plato, with Christianity, that life is a moral project. Nietzsche's going to argue that, that the emergence of that perspective in Socrates and Plato and Christianity, it, it, it not only just ends tragedy, right, as a kind of perspective, worldview, it, it not just ends a, a kind of way these heroic people lived, what they knew about the world, how they lived, and why Nietzsche valorizes that, why he celebrates it. It's not just that it ends, you know, the death of tragedy, but for Nietzsche, and this is what's most important, and we're going to turn to this, this set of ideas on Thursday, right? For Nietzsche, this represents the beginning of a long sickness in the psychology and in the mind and in the life and in the bodies of human beings in western civilization like this this simply cannot be exaggerated right and and this this gestures back to some of the ideas we were talking about in the first and second lectures right one of the one of the playful things that the title of the course does is initiate a tension and a reversal Right? The title of the course was A Politics of Tragedy or the Tragedy of Political Philosophy. Right? And, and Nietzsche is going to interpret the emergence of Socrates and Plato and by extension, um, metaphysical theology and, and now even enlightenment science and its normative social behavioral medical guises. He's going to, he, he's going to interpret it, that event as, as an event that has catastrophic consequences to how we conceive our mind, our bodies, and our politics, right? And, and for Nietzsche, Western society begins to, degenerate is such an ugly word, 
but it, it, it begins to, well, it suffers a kind of weakness. It suffers a kind of an exhaustion. It, it suffers a kind of nihilism, right? The, the emergence of Socrates and Plato signifies for Nietzsche a, 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 a kind of exhaustion, a kind of sickness of the mind, the body, and the politics that has catastrophic consequences for who we are, how we view life, how we view our mind, how we view our bodies, and how we view our politics. And, 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 and this, this kind of plays itself out very slowly for 1,500, 2,000 years of the kind of evolution and development of the metaphysical West. And ultimately, it culminates in us. We, we are, in a very poetic and kind of, kind of sad way, we are what Nietzsche calls the last people. We are the, we are the end of the, the sort of catastrophic consequences to our minds, bodies, and politics that metaphysics has set in motion. And we'll see that on Thursday when we kind of introduce very loosely what the hell postmodernism is? What did Nietzsche think he was doing um, when he kind of initiates what we will later call post metaphysical philosophy or post modern philosophy? All right. So, so this is really important. This is a critical moment, and, and this is and this is why, if we were to take it from a Nietzschean point of view, the the emergence, hence the title, the, the tragedy of political philosophy. For for Nietzsche, there's a there's a higher there's a there's a kind of higher level tragedy to the emergence of Socrates and Plato. It, it represents the beginning of a long era in Western society. So, so Nietzsche kind of flips the script. Traditionally, as we were playing with this idea in the first lecture, the second maybe lecture, traditionally we tend to, in, in, in the Enlightenment West, well, ever since Plato, ever since the, the way in which you know, certain types of Greek and Roman philosophy was incorporated by the Christian theorists and then the Enlightenment emerges. If you look at that history from a kind of a generalized point of view, we tend to recognize the moment of the birth of Western civilization and, and what is noble and, 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 and kind of powerful and progressive about Western civilization with Socrates. With Plato, that's you know the, the 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 idea that there's an objective truth out there that human beings are rational, that we can acquire this knowledge, apply it to our life, elevate our consciousness, solve crisis, reduce suffering, move in this progressive way. That's that in, in one way or another, and it's philosophical, it's Christian, it's now scientific manifestation. That's the dream of the West, and we locate the origin and the significance and the power and the optimism in that dream of Socrates and Plato. That's the script. And, and as I was, we have been playing with in, already in just the third week, you and I are the heirs of that. You know, uh, I've had now many courses with all of you. All of you will graduate in the spring. You'll graduate with political science degrees, right? Um, and, and we've spent four years educating you in, in political phenomena from a kind of scientific perspective, right? In some ways, and this is a beautiful thing, um, so don't take it too critical now. You have bought into that. You, you, you see the knowledge that we are providing through these institutions and these processes and these methodologies as kind of legitimate, as, as in some way kind of representing a fairly accurate and coherent description and encounter of, of reality, in this case, politics. And, and, and you've acquired this knowledge, right? And then you're going to and, and you've elevated yourself. We, as, as Foucault will say, we've turned peasants into lawyers. <laughs> right? we've, turned, we've turned peasants into social workers, peasants into doctors, peasants into professors, peasants into lawyers, right? We, we, you have improved your life and now you're gonna go out in the world and, and you're gonna fix families and you're gonna create urban policy and, and you're gonna do all sorts of wonderful things that, that we believe if we hadn't read Nietzsche, if we hadn't read Foucault, that is somehow getting us, if, at least slowly, closer and closer to the truth or the way things ought to be. Uh, and, 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 and Nietzsche takes a sledgehammer to that whole story. That, that's, that's what's important about Nietzsche. And even in this class, if, you know, if, if one of my obsessions in just teaching this class, even if 
just for an intellectual journey, just an intellectual adventure, is to say, well, what the fuck happens if we take a sledgehammer to that, to that, right? What if we, <laughs> what if we just, um, just for the sake of argument, look at the story from a different gaze, as Foucault liked to say. So, so that's where we are. This, so this is a critical moment. Um, the, for Nietzsche, the emergence of metaphysical philosophy and religion not only destroys the tragic and heroic perspective, but it initiates the beginning of a long sickness in Western society. And you and I, Nietzsche will argue, Foucault in some way will argue, are, are we, we are manifesting that sickness. It's, it's, it's in our perspective, it's in our nihilism, it's in our obsession with pleasure as happiness. Um, it's in our de cultural depression. Um, it's, we, we are that sickness. And, and, and we'll see this as we get deeper into the class. All right, so, so before we get into that, let's just take a step back and let's talk about what metaphysics is just from the just from the you know from the cruising altitude of 36,000 feet what 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 is metaphysics and what is it about metaphysics that Nietzsche is criticizing and as we will see on Thursday why does he criticize it and and again at the risk of boring you there's a kind of architecture to these first these first lectures if you if if you can get your head around what we talked about last week, Roman numeral one, if you can get your head around this, okay, what is metaphysics? What is it that Nietzsche's criticizing? Equally as important, why? What does that have to do with postmodernism? What's the tool he uses? It's a linguistic critique. It's called nominalism. If if we can get our heads around this flow, this architecture, you guys are like 70% down the path to mastering this. Okay. So Let's spend a few minutes just exploring what is metaphysics? What is it about metaphysics that Nietzsche is so damn critical about? And then on Thursday, we're going to see why. Okay. All right. Now, again, I know some of you have had me. And so you've probably heard some version of this. So if I'm, again, at the risk of boring you, I, I, I beg your, your patience. Um, but for those of you who haven't, it's really useful to, to run this drill, all right? So since we're in a kind of pro-seminar course, I'm going, to, I'm going to open this up a little more broadly um, and talk about metaphysics. So in Western culture, right, there have been, or uh, there have been at least three main metaphysical systems of thought in Western culture. And, and this is very general. I mean, you, we could open a bottle of whiskey and fucking smoke some cigarettes and really have a debate about the nuances of this. So the, the narrative I'm, I'm giving you is, is, is fairly general. But generally speaking, uh, in, in Western civilization, since Socrates, right, if, if, if we wanted to locate the origin of of metaphysics in Western civilization. We, we locate it with Socrates and Plato. And, and, if, and if we're standing here right now where we are, with the sidewalks melting in Northridge <laughs> at 120 degrees, right? Um, if, if we look at that sort of broad history, there have been three major metaphysical systems of thought that we can kind of easily identify. Three major metaphysical systems of thought. The first obviously is, is, is philosophy. There's a kind of emergence of what we can call metaphysical philosophy in, in, the, in the mind, in the voice of Socrates, in the writings of Plato, in Aristotle, in the Neoplatonists, in all the early Roman humanists and the, Ro the later, the mid and, and later Roman Stoics, right? Philosophy, Greek and Roman philosophy, from literally from, from Socrates to Boethius, all the way up to the emergence of New Testament Christianity around 3, 325 AD, 350 AD with the arrival of, of, of Roman Catholicism in Europe. That entire, that, that, what we would call that classical stage 
of political philosophy, that original and classical stage of political, of, of philosophy, of political philosophy was metaphysical. So the, the first great system of thought was philosophy. And by the way, that's still running around. Kant was, an, was one of the most recent great sort of philosophers in this metaphysical tradition, right? Um, so again, it, it begins with Socrates and, and it still exists in some ways. Um, now, the, the second major metaphysical system of thought is the emergence in Western culture of, of metaphysical theology, either some type of New Testament Christianity or Islam, right? The second great moment, or great in the sense of profound, big, right? The second critically important emergence of metaphysical thinking is the emergence of monotheistic theology, metaphysical monotheistic, mon, monotheistic, excuse me, theology. Now, the third system of metaphysical thought, the third system of metaphysical thought is what we could call loosely, and, and, th and this will be Foucault's analysis of the Enlightenment and of us, could loosely be called the, 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 in the Enlightenment, some, again, late 1680s, 1700s, 1750s, 1800s, 19, this, I'm using the word enlightenment very broadly, okay? Um, and, and what we would call in, in the enlightenment moment, the emergence of what we will call the normative, and we'll explain all that, don't worry, the normative social, behavioral, and medical sciences, right? The emergence of the normative, social, behavioral, and medical sciences. And, 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 and that great moment is our great moment. You and I are the heirs of that, of that moment. We are, <laughs> we are the, the living, breathing embodiment of this kind of enlightenment metaphysics, okay? So those are the three major systems. There's a kind of a philosophical metaphysics that begins with Socrates and Plato. There's an extraordinarily powerful metaphysical theology that emerges in, in the Western world that comes to dominate the world. And then there's the emergence of the scientific revolution kind of focused through the enlightenment and this normative social, medical and behavioral sciences. Now, what's, what's really important, I don't need to tell you this, but I just wanna just emphasize this. Each of these systems of thought the kind of philosophical metaphysics, a the theological metaphysics, the scientific metaphysics, each of these systems of thought tell fundamentally different stories, okay, about what the truth is, how human beings know it, and in some way, what human beings should do with it, okay? This is, and, and, and again, I know you know this, but I, I just want to make sure we understand this. Right? There, there are three great systems, metaphysical systems of thought. There's a philosophical system, a theological, and a kind of scientific. Now, each of these systems of thought, again, tell radically different stories about human mind, about human nature, about truth, about politics. Right? I mean, the, the, the kind of account of human mind and human body and human bo uh, politics that emerges out of New Testament Christianity and becomes a political force is fundamentally different, radically different than a kind of political philosophy emerging out of, out of the literature of, of, of Plato and Aristotle. It's fundamentally different. And, and one could even argue the, the narrative of, of the Enlightenment normative social behavioral medical sciences and the physical sciences, that narrative right, is fundamentally different than the narrative, right, of New Testament Christianity and the narrative of Aristotelian polis. The narratives are different, the stories are different. The Christians are telling a fundamentally different story about the origin, about God, about moral, in some ways, moral life, about politics than, than Plato or Aristotle. The Enlightenment sociologists and political scientists are telling a fundamentally different story about the truth and about knowledge and about politics and the body that the Christians were talking about. So the narratives are different, right? To be sure. 
But despite the fact, despite the fact that it's kind of a philosophical metaphysics or a religious metaphysics or, or an enlightenment metaphysics, despite the fact that those different systems of thought tell different stories, they give different accounts of what the hell they think is going on as truth. Despite the fact that the narratives are fundamentally different, all three systems of thought share the same assumptions and a kind of structural order. This is really important. All three metaphysical systems of thought share the kind of the, a similar commitment to the existence of truth and a kind of structural arrangement. And that's the key for Nietzsche. So when, so, so, so when Nietzsche levels a critique against metaphysics, right, it, 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 he's speaking simultaneously at the same time, a critique of philosophical metaphysics, a critique of religious metaphysics, a critique of scientific metaphysics, right? And, and so what is it that, that each of these systems of thought share? And how are they, when, when, I, when I say structurally similar, what the hell do I mean by that, right? And, and what is it about those things that Nietzsche critiques and as we will see on Thursday, why does he think the critique is important? Why is the critique of metaphysics important and essential and, and kind of the animating and, and, and informative power behind what will become postmodernism? What, what's going on there, all right? So, so what, is it, what is it that all metaphysical systems of thought share despite radically different narratives? Right, Aristotelian polis looks a lot different than the Christian polis, right? And both of those damn things look way different than the liberal democracies of the late enlightenment, right? So despite different narratives, what is it that all three of those systems of thought share and how, and, and, and what is it about their structural arrangements that they share? So, right, so first, and, and again, those of you who have had classes with me in the past, you know what this is, right? So first and foremost, all metaphysical systems of thought, philosophy, religion, enlightenment, science, they all argue that some notion of an objective truth exists. And by the way, this is, these are on your notes there, so you can kind of follow along. It's like story time I'm reading, and you can follow along, right? They all, Socrates and Plato, the emergence of monotheistic metaphysical religion and in a looser way, the emergence of enlightenment science, what we now call the scientific paradigm. All three of those systems of thought share this core idea that some type of objective truth exists. That transcends, that, it, that is prior to human mind, it is prior to the human body, and that is prior to the human politics. That some type of objective truth exists prior to mind, prior to the body, prior to the power and the entanglement of, of politics, right? An objective truth exists. Now, to be sure, right, this, because there are different narratives, this truth has come to be thought of in different ways, right? So if, if, if you guys had 350 with me, or, or some of you have the, the, the Greek political philosophy class now, right, you know that for Socrates and Plato, this truth was conceived of as an idea. This, by the way, this is the origin of the term idealism in philosophy. This is, this is its origin. Plato thought that the truth existed as an idea. What he will call the form or the pattern the idea that, that out there, out there, there was an idea, a true idea of justice, or there was a true idea of human nature. There was a true idea of love and friendship, right? Remember we, for many of us, we read the Crido together and the Crido was just this extraordinarily heartbreaking dialogue about friendship. What the fuck is friendship from Socrates and Plato's point of view, right? And, and for Socrates and Plato, there was some truth to friendship. And, and, and the damn dialogue is heartbreaking because Crito, who thinks he was friends with Socrates for 70 years, never fucking got it, right? So, so for, 
Socratic and Platonic philosophy, the truth is conceived of as an idea, right? That, that there's an idea, there's a, and in fact, not, not just an idea for concepts like justice and truth, uh, but even for the body. Please, please mute, whoever's not muted there. Um, and, and, and also for politics, right? Now, obviously, if for, for the emergence of Western theology, metaphysical theology, the truth is no longer conceived of as an idea. The truth is now conceived of as what? God. God. It's God. It's, it's some type of, of divine being, divine presence, divine source, divine essence, however you want to think of it. It's God, right? The, the, the truth becomes sort of imagined by, by the New Testament Christians, by, by the emergence of, of, of Islam in Western culture thought very broadly. Again, I'm using these terms very broadly um, as God. So the idea God as the truth kind of comes to replace the Platonic um, and, and the Roman humanist and the Stoic notion of truth as an idea, right? So, and then of course, uh, for the enlightenment, truth is a, in, in, in another way, still kind of an, it's a, it's a kind of an idea. It's a, a kind of seen as a set of biological and natural processes and laws that are out there and, and function according to their own dynamics um, and necessities quite independently of human mind. So there's a truth. And so, so, all metaphysical systems of thought sort of share this idea that some objective truth exists, whether it's conceived of as an idea, whether it's conceived of as some divine presence or God, or whether it's conceived of as some sort of set of biological and, and natural phenomena, laws and dynamics that operate according to their own set of, of rules and laws and dynamics that we can understand and acquire knowledge of and apply, right? So, so they're committed to some idea of an objective truth. Now, also too, whatever, whatever this truth is, whether it's an idea, whether it's God, whether it's a set of biological, human kind of biological, psychological, or natural phenomena and processes, whatever this thing that is true, it's, it's again, and forgive me if I'm boring you, but it's true for three reasons. And, and, and again, this is actually, it's not boring. This is really important actually to nail down, right? It's, it's true. Something, something is true according to Plato or something is true according to Christianity or something is true according to science right? If it, if it possesses three characteristics, right? If it fulfills three conditions, right? And, and we've talked about this many times. First, it's got to apply where? Everywhere. Everywhere. Love you guys. It's got to apply when? All the time. All the time. Love you guys. And most importantly, yeah, it's got to apply to everyone, right? And, 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 and this this is what makes something universal. This is what makes something objective, right? It's objective, right, in the sense precisely because it applies everywhere all the time to everyone. It's not subjective in the sense that it emerges out of Nick Dungy's head and applies only in Nick Dungy's time and in Nick Dungy's space and in Nick Dungy's life. It's not subjective in that sense. It is, precise, it is precisely because whatever justice is according to Plato, whatever, whatever God is according to the New Testament Christians, whatever, whatever biological biochemical neural processes are going on in the brain, whatever those things are. They are objective in the sense that whatever justice is, it, uh, it's always been there. It's whether we knew it or not, it's applied everywhere, whether we knew it or not. And it applies to everybody. That's precisely, it's, that's why something is universal. That's why it is objective. 
It is, it is, and, 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 and some of these terms get caught up in this mod, this metaphysical, post-metaphysical debate. So that's why I'm kind of boring you with this stuff. If we say something is objectively true, we absolutely do not mean that it's something that emerges from just Nick Dungy's mind, that it emerges just from Nick Dungy's space and time and, and being. It's not, it's not subjective in that narrow sense. It's objective. It applies everywhere, all the time and to everybody. Professor? Yep. So I'm so confused. I, I don't know, this question has been the, in my mind this whole time. So what happens to uh, the Old Testament? Why is it the emphasis, uh, emphasis on the New Testament? And why not on the, I forgot to read, the Jewish um, yeah. book? I don't know. I don't so, understand so if there's like an idea. So technically the Old Testament is an idea too. And so is the Torah kind of, right? Yeah. Well, so again, I'm no, I'm no scholar, religious scholar here. So, you know, forgive me. Let me just put it in the kind of language that we will talk about this in terms of the emergence of an objectivity. Okay. The Old Testament is not, as I understand it, is not a metaphysical religion. It's not a metaphysical religion. And why isn't it a metaphysical religion? Because there's not a person or something. No, look, so, so, so you, you it have- the, It didn't apply all the time. Yeah, also, and also to what else, Samantha? And it didn't apply to everyone. It was, uh, it applied to yeah. the Jews. Yeah. And this is, and again, some of this, and, and if I'm saying controversial stuff in terms of Judaic studies and biblical studies, please forgive me. It is my understanding that, and by the way, it's not just my understanding. You see this perspective. You see this perspective in all of the pre-metaphysical religious systems. You see this even in the Greek. You see this in the Egyptian. You see it in the Persian. You see it in the Greek, the Homeric Greek religious system. And you see echoes of this in the kind of Old Testament Jewish perspective. And, and what the hell am I talking about? For example, Aaron had buzzed in on in uh, office hours last week, I was asking this question. And by the way, it's and by the way, this is a fascinating question, and I'm I'm and I'm kind of glad we brought this up because it's it it's a really fascinating issue about the Homeric and the tragic worldview, and about how they view things. And by the way, it's it's it's. It's interesting, and it's something that we now have a very hard time doing. And, and it gets to your question, Jennifer, about the Old Testament. So let me, let me get to your question about the Old Testament by talking about the Greeks of the tragic age. Okay? okay. And so, and, and especially the Greeks of a tragic age and their religious views, their moral and their religious views, in a way that was not metaphysical, right? So, so the Greeks, the, the Greeks that lived before Socrates, the Greeks that lived before the emergence of metaphysical philosophy, they had very developed, very sophisticated religious beliefs that they derived in one way or another from the oral traditions that predated the Homeric text, from the emergence of the Homeric text, the way the Homeric text gave rise to a, an account of who the gods were, where they lived, what they did. And the Greeks took that very seriously. There's no question about it, right? If, if, you, were, if, if you were a Greek living during the time of Sophocles or Aeschylus, any time 
during and even up and even into the emergence of Socrates and the execution of Socrates and the emergence of Plato. If, if you were a Greek, you, you conceived of the gods as the Greek pantheon, as Zeus and Hera and Poseidon and all the various secondary gods, right? Those were the gods. Those were the gods. And, 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 and they constituted a kind of comprehensive, if kind of loosely structured, moral and religious reality. But if you were Greek living before Socrates, you took that reality absolutely seriously. You took that reality with as much seriousness as, as we can conceive of how we take religion now seriously now. And, and I would even go so far as to say they believed it. Of course they believed it. They, they believed it. The gods, the, what, what, the gods were real. And, and the gods were true in whatever sense they conceived of the word true. Right? And this is important. And so even think, even, even think of the story Socrates tells in his apology. Socrates is at his trial. Right? Socrates is at his trial. And to defend himself against not, the, the charge of not believing in the gods or inventing new gods, Socrates tells the story of his friend Euthyphro. Not Euthyphro, Chariphon, excuse me, Chariphon. Right? And that story, and who knows, maybe it's made up, maybe it's not made up. People, it, 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 again, these are fucking stories. Right? But Socrates tells the story of Chariphon, his friend. And Chariphon goes, travels three days, several days to the oracle at Delphi, to, to, to the Apollo, to, to Delphi, where the temple of Apollo is and the oracles of Delphi are. The single most important and profound and mystical religious place in the Greek world. There's no spot in the entire Greek world more sacred, more mystical, more, more religious, more divine, more real in that sense for the Greeks. You, you are going to the temple of Apollo, you are going to the oracles at Delphi. And that's the single most important religious place you can go. And Euthyphro went there and he asked the, the priestesses inside the, the, the cave, who's the wisest person in Athens? And the story goes, the gods through the, through the priestesses said, Socrates. So Chariphon took that seriously. He believed it. It was true to him. What the, what the gods had spoken through the mouths of the priestesses as this kind of divine revelation, this divine prophecy about who's the wisest, Chariphon took absolutely seriously. Believed it. For the Greeks during the, Pel during the Persian War or during the Peloponnesian War. Before every major battle. For every major battle. Before every important political decision. The Greeks would have sacrificed. They would have, they would have went through a very sophisticated, very ritualized, very specific series of, of sacrificial rituals and processes and praying. And they did that with utter and total and absolute seriousness. Which means they believed it in some way. It was real. I don't want to use the word true because I don't know what they thought of as true. Because our conception of what something means to be true we get from who? We get it from who? God. From ourselves. No, where's our original? Where's the first conception of what things mean, what, what truth is in our society? Our family. Socrates. Socrates, thank you. What the hell's wrong with you guys? Socrates. <laughs> no, this is very important. This, in fact, this is, this is part of the class. So pay attention. Now, now, here's 
what they could do that we can't do because we're the heirs of metaphysical systems of thought. We almost can't even comprehend it. And this gets to your question, Jennifer, finally, about Old Testament Judaism and their conception of God. Because the, the, the Jews of the Old Testament, they absolutely believed that God was what? Real. Real. Who knows what they thought of truth? Who knows? Just like, just like Caraphron really believed that, that the gods, the Greek gods, speaking through the voices of the priestesses was what? Real. It wasn't a joke. They, they, weren't, they weren't playing a game when they did this. But the key point here is it would have never occurred to the Greeks, just like it never would have occurred probably to the, the Jewish people of the Old Testament to say, our God is the, is the what? True no God. God. True God. That's right. That's, this, is, this is critically important. It never would have occurred to the Greeks that lived before Socrates, who believed in Zeus, who believed in Poseidon, who believed in Hera, who took the religious rituals and the mysticism and the processes and the sacrifices, they took that as deadly serious as any person alive right now who believes in, in some type of divine being. But the differences between a metaphysical and a pre-metaphysical culture, this is the key. And this is what, I, this is what was going on with, with Old Testament Judaism. The Greeks believed their gods were real, but it never occurred to them to think of and expect that their God was the only what? True God. True God. And equally as important that their gods applied to whom? Everyone. Everyone. Love you guys. Beautiful. Damn beautiful. Spice. If this was a cooking show, you'd go bam right now. Right? But and, and, and as idiotic as my jokes are, pardon me, this is a really important point. It's a powerful point, right? I mean, the Greeks, the Greeks knew that the Egyptian empire and the Egyptian culture had existed thousands of years before Homer, thousands of years before the Greeks of the tragic age. Protagoras, the, the inventor of mathematics, went to Egypt. Plato went to Egypt. Greeks, both, both, both non-metaphysical and metaphysical Greeks, went to Egypt. And there they would have seen the pyramids. There they would have heard from their Greek counterparts the stories of the Greek, of the Egyptian gods. Right? the whole complex, sophisticated Egyptian religious system. And the Greeks would have said, God, that's fascinating, okay? And they would have went back home, and what would they have done? They would have continued to worship who? Zeus, and Hera, and Poseidon. And it never would have occurred to them to go back to Athens and say, it never would have occurred to them to go back to Athens and say, Boy, those Egyptians, they've got it what? Wrong. Wrong. Beautiful. It never would have occurred to them to say, those Egyptians or those Persians, they got it wrong. Their gods, their gods are what kind of gods? False. False gods. Beautiful. Their gods aren't the what gods? Right. True gods. Why? Never never would have occurred to them. It, did, it wasn't part of the structure of their consciousness, right? And by the way, this is fascinating, right? Because you and I, you and I, we are the heirs. We, we, are, we are the people who lived after Plato. We are the people that lived after New Testament Christianity. We are the people that are caught up and entangled in the obsession of enlightenment science which tells us in different ways, but tells us the damn 
the same damn thing. Whatever the truth is, it exists where? Everywhere. Everywhere. It exists when? All the time, and it applies to whom? Everyone. Everyone. Right, and that, that structure of consciousness as a philosophical phenomenon, as a religious phenomenon, as a, as a, as a scientific phenomenon, makes it, it has, has structured a view that we have philosophically, religiously, scientifically, culturally, that, that, that if something is true, right, there, there, there can't be multiple what? Truths. There, 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 someone's got to be wrong. Right, the Christians say now to the to the Muslims, you, you just don't get it. You're you you you've got it wrong. I know you think you're right, but you're just lost. Here, read a little more. Come to my church. Come to come over here. We we are so structured by by the presence and the force and the power and the consequences. Hence Nietzsche's deconstruction of this of something as true that has to be singularly true. And anything that derives, that deviates, or, or de, de, you know, kind of deviates, or, or it just falls off, it is somehow untrue. It's inferior. It's secondary. In the language of Christianity, it's dirty. It's polluted. In the language of health, it's unhealthy. It's diseased. It's sick. It's unhealthy. So, so the Greeks who lived before metaphysics, the Greeks who lived before Socrates and Plato, and it's, again, it's fascinating. Just, just again, just, and again, I'm no biblical scholar, and if I'm wrong, someone send me a message, and, and I'll get it. I'll learn. But, but from what I know, and how you structure this in the kind of deeper philosophical sense, the, 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 the Jews of the Old Testament, they believed in, in their God. And they took it very seriously. And, okay, and, 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 but they never, they never expected, they, they never said our God applies to whom? Everyone. 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 It didn't occur to them. So they were tribal. They were tribal in their religion. Well, Professor, I was going to tell you that uh, even though like, I understand your explanation, it's, the, it's just for me that I can see the separation because I, I'm a Christian and then I was taught to believe that we also have to believe in the Old Testament. So, for example, in the Old Testament said um, something about us. So that was implying that Jesus would come later. So it was already like mentioning like bringing the New Testament. And that's why I'm confused, you know. Because yeah. I'm like, okay, so if they're interconnected and I still have to believe in the Old Testament and the yeah. New Testament, how do you separate them? That's, I, that was what it was. I don't know about. what to tell you, Jennifer. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, that's, that's, a, you, that's, a, that's something that you have to, to work out inside your, your, your connectivity there. Okay. All right. Yeah, All right. So let's keep going. Two, critically important. It's not just that there's some truth out there and that whether it's an idea, a God, or some type of natural phenomena or process or biological process that applies everywhere all the time and to everyone, but two, critically important, that there has to be something unique and special about human beings that provides us awareness of and access to it. This is critical, right? And, and, and Plato called it reason. In, in one way or another, people committed to some type of, of theological metaphysics called the soul. Science, again, calls it a modified form of reason, right? The second major element about metaphysics is that there's there there and, and again this makes sense right because even if even if there's some idea of justice out there even if god's out there even if there are true 
natural laws and phenomena and process. If you're a cat, doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter. Because you're not what? Human. Yeah, you're not human. You're not aware of it in some way. You don't have reason. You don't have a soul. You don't have this, this mental capacity that calls you to, to discern things that are true from things that are instinctual. So the second major element of all metaphysical systems of thought is that there's something unique. There's something special and unique about human beings that first makes us aware of the truth. And then if we activate it, provides us access to it. And of course, for Plato, this was reason. This is this, this reason, as Plato said, is a special faculty unique to human beings that connects us to this truth, right? It connects us to this truth. The soul, if, if, if you are committed to some type of theological metaphysics, you believe you, you possess a what? A soul, right? And, and, and you, you make this argument, again, loosely generalizing, don't ask me about the specifics of internal debates about religion. But you make this distinction between things that have souls and things that don't have souls. And not only do you make this distinction, but you, you are in some way committed to the idea that what does a soul do, right? What does it do? Well, it makes you aware of divine revelation. It makes you aware of a divine presence. Okay. That's how you know God. That's how you're connected. All right. So there's something about human beings that is unique, that makes us aware of truth and provides us access to it. Now, I'm gonna slide something in here. We're gonna to get to this much deeper as we get deeper into Nietzsche and especially in Foucault. This means at a very deep level for metaphysical philosophy and for metaphysical religion. This, especially those two, less so for science, it's more nuanced, but, but for platonic philosophy, and for New Testament Christian and Islamic theology, this means something, the, the assumption is quite deep. This means, and, and this is Plato, and this is some version of a Christian metaphysic. This means that by virtue of being a rational creature, right, reason is, is, is something unique and special to human beings that is simultaneous with the body but not produced by it, right, just like the soul. The soul is something unique to human beings. It's simultaneous with the body, but not produced by the body. The soul is not a material phenomenon. Reason is not a material phenomenon, right? Whatever Plato thinks reason is, whatever the Christians think the soul is, they are not things that are produced by the what? By the body. They're simultaneous with the body, but they're not reducible to it, nor produced by it. Right? Which means, if you accept those assumptions, that by nature, by virtue of being who you are, you, you and I are according to Plato, or who you and I are according to some type of theological metaphysics, we always already possess, in a weird way, the content of the truth where? In our minds. In our minds. Or in our what? Souls. In our souls. That's right. And then, of course, the whole metaphysical project, whether it's philosophy or whether it's theology, is to kind of get in contact with the truth that's already where? In our, in our minds. And get, in, and, and get that truth, kind of find the right idea, find the right word, the right language, and connect the content that's already in our mind or the content and the openness that's already in our souls to its greater manifestation. That's, that's profound. And which, by the way, as we will see, I'm going to slide this in right now, which means that for all metaphysical systems of thought, philosophy, theology, or science, 
in one, and again, they have different ways of conceiving this, but all schools of thought can see, think that there's an objectively true what? Self. There's an objectively true self. There's an objectively true Nick Dungy. There's an objectively true Samantha and Ruth and Jennifer and Jacob and Leslie and Christina. Right? That there's something objectively true about Nick Dungy. Nick Dungy isn't just the effect of cultural power or, or a kind of linguistic power and, 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 and imagination. Nick Dungy's a rational creature. Inside of Nick Dungy's mind is his content put there about the truth and about the truth of who he is, what he's, what he's supposed to do, what his purpose is, what his talents are, what the correct and moral way of living are. Right? And, 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 and the deep narrative of all metaphysical systems of truth, and we know this, we say it all the time, Figure out, figure out who you what we are. are. Figure, and, and when we say that, we mean it. Figure out who your true self is. Figure that out. Who are you supposed to be? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to live? And what? And then do it. Right? That's the, that's the deep project on an individual level of metaphysics. Doesn't matter whether it's philosophy, theology, or, or a kind of normative enlightenment, social, medical, and behavioral sciences. Right? And by the way, this hooks up to the very tragic story I told you two weeks ago. Painful. And, and, and it's, 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 in some ways, it's just a stupid example. In fact, it would be a stupid example if it wasn't so catastrophic. The, we, we were talking about the LSAT last week, just as one kind of exaggerated example. When people, people I, I, I don't hear from people who do, my students, my students, They study and they work and they prepare, they connect their value, they protect, connect their meaning, they, 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 they connect their future to this test. And there's lots of complex reasons why that is. And if they don't do well on it, they're shattered. They're shattered. And again, lots of complex reasons and nuanced reasons for that. But at the very core, driving the shattering, driving the shattering is this sense that, that the low score says something about their what? Intellect, their mind about their mind, about their intellect, and, and, and the particular way that this culture measures that and values it. Now, it, it, it wouldn't be shattering. This is the key. And this is what Nietzsche's going to really rip into. This is what Foucault is going to rip into. It wouldn't, getting a terrible grade or getting a terrible score, OK. I guess it might hurt or it might be damaging or, you know, it, it might be something, but it wouldn't be shattering if we didn't what? Believe it. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Believe it. Believe it, but believe what? Believe that this score reveals something. something what? True. About ourselves. True. True about who? Us. Ourselves. That's right. We believe it. Now, we believe it culturally. We're not sitting there thinking, you know, we're not working it through in this microanalysis. We believe it culturally. Because, and, and we believe it culturally because we are the heirs of what, science, of what metaphysical system? Social behavior. Yes. Yeah, we're the enlightenment. This kind of normative social behavioral medical sciences. We think these tests, the psychiatry tests, the biology test for ADHD and learning disabilities and, and, and low LSAT scores, 
We believe these tests are in some magical way measuring and revealing something objectively what? True about us. About us. And, if, and, and, and God forbid, no pun intended, if what it's revealing happens to fall on the wrong spectrum, on the wrong side of the scale. It's shattering be precisely because we think it's what? True. True. And if it's true, that means there's very little or almost nothing you can what? Do about, about it. it. Do about it. Who the fuck are you to alter the truth? To alter the neurobiochemistry in your brain? Or that, that, that this makes you incapable of figuring out these language games in 38 seconds? Or, or other things. What if, what, if, what, if, what, if, what if you are committed to some kind of, kind of theological metaphysics and, and it's just true about you that you're a deviant, you're morally deviant, you're sexually deviant. You're outside the moral spectrum. Much you can do about it or little you can do about it. Nothing little, you can do about it. Little. And then what becomes of the rest of your life? I'm sick. I'm a moral deviant. I'm sinful. I'm a disgrace. Fuck. The same things functioning in a kind of platonic metaphysics. If we wanted to get really dark about it. And even Plato got to this. <laughs> in 411, we're going to see the same moment up the river from a different perspective. Even if we are sympathetic to Plato's philosophy, which, which I, that's, that's the story I'm telling in 411. If you take 411 with me, you're, you're getting a whole different movie than this, than this movie. And even in that movie, where we take Platonic metaphysics seriously and we're, we're looking at what Plato's talking about. Even in that story, the heart of darkness in that story is precisely the fact that Euthyphro and Miletus and Crito aren't intellectually capable of doing philosophy, which means they're not intellectually capable of acquiring moral virtue, which means they're not intellectually capable of being self-governing, which means they remain children and need to be governed. <laughs> All right. We'll pick this up on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one. Have a great day. Fabulous, beautiful Thank people. Thank you, Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Yep, great job. You. Love you guys. Thank you, Professor. Have a nice day. Bye.